Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coop Cast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop. And for those longtime listeners of the podcast, you will absolutely recognize the fact that I love to bring on guests that can blend the worlds of sports science and coaching, and particularly those sports scientists that are at the very top of their game that work individually with athletes. I feel that that is a very rare combination in today's world of athletics, and I can think of no better example of the pinnacle of that than the guest today, Inigo San Milan. Inigo has coaching chops beyond any guests that I've actually had on this podcast, and that's saying a lot. He has been an advisor to many of the professional cycling teams over the course of his career, as well as the individual cyclists themselves. And in 2020, he was the coach of the Tour de France champion, Tade Pokagar, which is the pinnacle of that particular sport. And any time a coach reaches that particular pinnacle of their sport and gets to work with an athlete, it should absolutely be celebrated. But Inigo also has this rare capability and rare talent of also being one of the most influential people in the world when it comes to cancer and cancer metabolism. And he uses his knowledge of sports science of sports science and how elite athletes work to better understand how cancer works, which is an absolutely fascinating area for anybody to study. During the course of this podcast, we talk a lot about his particular testing protocols that he uses on elite athletes, as well as how he's able to use elite athletes as this model of perfection, the Ferraris and the Formula One cars of their particular fields and apply it into the cancer domain. It was an absolutely fascinating conversation. I hope to have Inigo back on the podcast again and again and again, and I'm honored and humbled that he would come on the podcast today to share some tidbits of information. So here we go, I'm gonna get right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Inigo Samalan. I see your yellow jersey in the background. I I wanna pass on my congratulations. Oh, Uh, thank you, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, with, with, it's, I mean, from, from coach to coach, I mean, that's just one of the most amazing things in the world. And I know that you've been giving, you've been getting a lot of kudos over the course of the past several months. So you can oh, get thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> it worked. I think that, uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, it's just, it was, it was a good one. I have to admit. Yeah. So, uh, but also, yeah, we, you know, Roglic didn't have a, his best day either. Right. Uh, in the time trial. So it, uh, all the planets were aligned that day. <laughs> well, those three weeks, right? <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. Thing, exactly. right? A lot of a lot of people don't realize that it's a lot of racing to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although it, although it does come down to, and you've been involved in cycling long enough to understand this, it always comes down to, you know, an hour or three worth of racing. Mm-hmm. You know, out of the eighty or ninety hours total. Um, at the, at the end of the day, it's all four or five critical things that happen over the course of those three weeks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's three weeks. You just change that one day, right? <laughs> I know, right. Yeah. You can't, you, you can't, you can't just boil it down to one day for sure. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason I was requesting this now and not a little further on in the summer is I know based on your schedule that April, May, June starts to get really, really busy for you. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is ridiculous. And and I, uh, I have to do something. I have like three jobs now. Or so it's at the university where we're wrapping up uh, different um, uh, research studies at the same time. And it's been really whew, uh, cutthroat. And then with uh, with the team, you know, it is whew, it just never ending, you know, because uh, we are already I'm not even thinking about today's races. I'm thinking about well, the Tour de France. <laughs> I was just speaking with Tade and we're preparing the pre Tour de France training camp already. We have to finalize the place, the reservations, the roads. Uh, uh, I'm going, I'm flying on Sunday to to Brussels to do uh, wind tunnel with Tade on Monday. Um, I'm flying sa- sa- no, on Tuesday. And then from there we go to Basque Country. So we're there's a lot of things to prepare. So I'm way behind schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get caught up. Unfortunately, you have a really good athlete that you've got your hands on that can that can uh, probably cycle by himself, right? <laughs> 
yeah, it's a, it's it's always a good to work with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I kind of sent you over in the outline, like I've been really fascinated with your with your career and obviously it's taken off particularly as of late i mean any any time you have somebody like a tour de france winner or an iron man winner or an olympic gold medalist or something like that all of that athletes uh support system kind of gets put in the spotlight but the reality is is like you've been involved in these two what might be perceived as very different worlds for a long time elite endurance sport and in particular cycling and then cancer research. And I, I've loved the way that you have woven those two worlds together from an, mainly from an academic perspective and looking at and using elite athletes as a model to understand disease as a model of not perfection, but, but optimization. I'm, mm -hmm. you, I might be putting words in your mouth a little bit, but for the listeners to kind of like understand like who you are a little bit, maybe I think it would be helpful if you explain like how you got there and, and what this framework is of using elite athletes to understand this particular cancer disease model. Well, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I uh, appreciate it. So my background is in physiology. I, uh, although I started in, in the sports medicine field, um, um, you know, I, I, I decided to, to, to really, I was very fascinated by everything related to metabolism and physiology, first physiology. And this is where I, uh, I went to the School of Medicine and, and, and that's where I did my doctorate in physiology. So uh, I'm a physiologist by training, but, um, um, and, and, and more and more the physiology field has evolved uh, into more uh, because of the better tools that we have nowadays to understand physiology. It has led us to, um, uh, cellular physiology and metabolism, cellular metabolism by bioenergetics, and especially another uh, mitochondrial function. And this is what I I, I, I I was very, very interested, very passionate about it. And uh, I had great mentors and I, 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 I read um, and, I, and I learned tremendously from uh, Dr. George Brooks, who is, he's been you know, like 25 years ahead of all of us in this at least, and um, so anyways, uh, I was very interested in all this. So the, the, and, and, and somehow I, I, because I was working in sports medicine clinic, I, I, I got involved also in athletes and that's what I started to apply these methodologies and knowledge with athletes. And, and, and I was lucky to understand very well how the body works in these elite athletes um, who are the, the, the Ferraris or Lamborghinis of all cars, right? Is that the gold standard, right? So when I came to the School of Medicine um, 12 years ago here in Colorado from, from Spain, that was what was I was before, uh, that's where I was exposed to, uh, to many different chronic diseases. And I started to interact with uh, a lot of uh, researchers and clinicians in different areas from cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, ICU patients, cancer. And that's why I started to understand a lot about, uh, about these fields, right? So, um, and, and what I saw right away, when I started to look at the metabolic response of, 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 of many uh, uh, patients with these chronic diseases is that they, they were in the opposite metabolic pole of what elite athletes are. And, and I always have thought that it's difficult to understand imperfection if you don't know perfection in the first place. Mm. And what I, under, what I was continuously in my interactions with, uh, with, with many researchers and clinicians in, in different diseases is that, you know, everybody's stumbling upon mitochondrial function, cellular uh, function, right? And, 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 and not getting many answers. And this is what I was wondering, like, well, maybe from what we have learned from athletes, we can develop or, 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 or understand better other diseases. So, so this is where I started to to get very involved into this, and specifically to cancer, um, you know, the, the, there is this one thing is called the Warburg effect, right? That is the, the first transformation of a normal cell into cancer cell um, that Otto Warburg uh, discovered in 1923. Uh, Nobel laureate, he was a hundred years ago ahead of us, right? So he already described that. Uh, it's it's a it's a um, metabolic reprogramming that, that a, a normal cell suffers where they start utilizing a lot more glucose for energy purposes and also produce a lot of lactate. 
And uh, the, the lactic production was what, what struck Warburg. Not necessarily the glucose production, it was the lactic production. Why in the world they lactate? So anyways, the whole, the whole purpose, uh, but, but he didn't have the time, I mean, the technology 100 years ago to understand this very well, right? Although in concept, he was already a century ago and he even already, before even glycolysis was proposed, which by the way, glycolysis was, fi was finalized by uh, um, Meyerhoff, who was uh, his mentee, right? Um, um, with Emden, the emden Mayer pathway, that's called also glycolysis. Mm -hmm. So before even glycolysis was discovered, he was already proposing that there was a mitochondrial dysfunction in cancer, uh, an injury of mitochondrial uh, uh, respiration. So anyways, uh, upon the, the arrival of genetics, um, the, uh, everything related to cancer metabolism uh, was buried, disappeared, gone. And the world effect as well. Um, and, uh, and that was in 1953. And the whole thing of cancer uh, shift towards uh, genetics. And this is when, uh, um, uh, well, everything was about genetics for 50 years. Right. Until recently, uh, you know, genetics, we know that hasn't solved, hasn't cured cancer and, and hasn't uh, helped us to understand much about the biology of cancer. And even uh, Watson, who discovered DNA, who's still alive, He's saying now that um, the efforts to, to understand cancer through genetics have been, quote, uh, remarkably unhelpful. And if he were to do it all over again, he would look into cellular metabolism. Mm. So, so anyways, and, and, and long story short, so I kept hearing that that's where the whole word where fed came back to life. Right. And a lot of people start to talk a lot again about the word effect and and obviously I started hearing about it, but I thought it was a genetics thing. And I'm not a geneticist. I'm not an expert in genetics at all. So I was like, that's not for me. I'm not going to read it. But one night I said, okay, this is the world we face. It's time to, to, to read about what the hell is that? And when I read it, I said, wow, this is not genetics. This is metabolism. And this is the subject of my doctorate thesis. However, in, in exercise physiology or in physiology in general, we don't call it the world we face. We call it aerobic glycolysis or cytosolic glycolysis, right? And that's why I never connected the dots yeah. of a work for effect. So anyways, I, 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 I started to read about it. And uh, obviously, I, I, yeah, I was the whole night without sleeping. And I said, wow, you know, like, I think I, I can try to put some of the, of the pieces of the puzzle together. Because yeah, the, the, the work for effect, um, again, that was the, the subject of my doctorate thesis, but I did it in muscle. And the players are identical. Right, the, the, the difference in the muscle are perfectly regulated, whereas in cancer are all over the place. So I tried to 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 uh, to try to explain. So for seven months I was working, you know, in the middle of the night, um, you know, like uh, until very late, putting together the draft of of what I would try to put the pieces of the puzzle together and come up with an explanation of what the word brief it was and that and the purpose. And, and when I finished that, I went to to my colleague and, and mentor, George Brooks. And I said, hey, I think we can explain the word where he fed, give it a shot. And so we, we, we polished the, the first draft and we, we finally published it. And we believe that we have at least attempted and, and, and given a reason and a purpose to, to, to explain the, the word where effect in cancer from lessons learned from exercise physiology. Uh, so this just dawned on me and ago that you will probably be the only person in history, well, who knows, 50, 80, 100 years from now, you might be the only person in history that has coached somebody to a Tour de France victory, as well as had seminal contributions in a medical related field, in particular cancer. I mean, I, I, th I just think that that's remarkable to, to have, have an impact in both of those worlds, which a lay person would look at as not as interrelated as they actually are. And in a lot of ways, I, I think that like you've leveraged your knowledge of, of this specific type of metabolism, and we're going to get to athletes because that's going to be our, our main <laughs> audience here. You've been able to leverage that in an uncanny way, so much so that like you have a really specific testing protocol that you use with a lot of athletes, in, including Tade, that is 
I would say it's 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 indifferent for most of the lactate threshold and VO2 max protocols that are out there. Why don't we start to run through that a little bit and why you use this specific testing protocol with athletes and why do you think it's so valuable as compared to the typical three to four minute stages that we see in other tests? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. So yeah, when I when I first started, um, uh, you know, we were doing everybody, you know, we're including me, we we're doing the classical three yeah. minute incremental test um, and, and and working with professional cyclists. Uh, and I remember one professional cycling team, I, I, I would see that using this protocol, the, the best cycling in the in the in the, in, in, the, in the team who, who was a podium uh, to the France podium, Belopi, you know, mm-hmm. he was one of the worst guys on the team. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a very good cyclist. And exactly, very poorly. And, and, and and one of the top cyclists. I mean, and 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 the best cyclist and in this protocol was an average cyclist, right? So obviously, you know, as a scientist, you cannot translate this information and tell a world class cyclist that he sucks, right? Uh, <laughs> obviously, something was wrong, right? They they they, they so that's what I, I decided to 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 change the protocol and. And, and, and the problem with these protocols is that specifically to cycling, right? There's a very short protocols and they're in absolute watts. So someone who is 80 kilos, they're always going to do it better than someone who's 60 kilos, always, right? And this is why these protocols didn't work. And this is why also uh, athletes in general, they did not believe in these protocols because as Veloki told me and as others told me, I say, hey, every time I do a, one of these max tests, I suck. And everybody tells me that I, <laughs> how in the world I can be a good cyclist. So obviously I said, there's something wrong with how we're doing things, right? So, I, hold on one second. I think we yeah. need to back up a little bit. So the, the, the typical test that you're describing, and this is still the test that they use at the Olympic Training Center, which I'm sure you're, uh, which you're, which you're familiar with, is a graded exercise test. And it kind of doesn't matter whether you're doing it running or cycling. The setup is the same. You'll start out at a, at a certain workload that the that usually the practitioner determines, and it's usually an easy workload. And you will increase the speed if you're doing a running test or the power if you're doing mm-hmm. a cycling test by a fixed amount. Yeah. In a, in a professional cycling set, setting, it's usually 50 watts is what we see. Mm-hmm. And you're increasing that, you're increasing the workload 50 watts. And on the running side, it might be like three tenths of a mile per hour or the equivalent amount of, of seconds per mile, 40 seconds a mile. Or yeah. Like that. Every thir- every three or four minutes. So what you're sa- what you're describing as a short stage is three or four minutes, and then that increase will keep on going, going and going and going and going. And then depending upon the type of test, either they'll break for the VO2 max portion, or the, or or they'll just take them to volitional exhaustion in the act. Exactly. That that's the that is what we'll call the classic lactate threshold and VO2 max test. Mm-hmm. Now, what you're yeah. describing, what you developed is different because mm-hmm. everybody's saying that they suck. <laughs> yeah, I saw that, that, that there was not discrimination and the discrim- well, it was discrimination, but the, 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 the undesirable way where the, right. if you're a lighter cyclist, you would never be good at these tests. And if you're a heavier cyclist, you would be the best. So what I did is like, okay, we need to, to improve this. And what I did, it was normalizing in, in, in terms of watts per kilogram, right? So that you would do your workload at each step is normalized for everybody. So everybody is doing the same based on what's per kilogram. And that, that's, that's when the tests start to be more fair, right? Uh, then what I did is that uh, I, 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 I made the stages longer, right, to 10 minutes. So the, fir- the first stages, you know, I, I realized that, you know, when you're in very low intensities, uh, five, five to 10 minutes is not, not going to make much of a difference because at that intensity, the, 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 the cyclist in this case, it can be for hours. Yeah. So it was a waste of time and we don't want to be an hour and a half because these protocols end up being like an hour, especially yeah, right. in, in, in world-class athletes. So what I did is like uh, to do just five minutes, which is enough uh, um, to get some steady state. Uh, and then when they hit about three to 3.5 watts per kilogram, I increased it to 10 minutes. And what I wanted to realize then is like to see, okay, you know, first, if we do one minute increment, as many people do, or two minutes increment, it, the chances are very, very high chances that the lactate, which a lot of th- things that a lot of people were not doing either, which is VO2 max and getting right. from the ventilatory threshold, right? 
right. but lactate is a key aspect to understand its cellular metabolism. So what I would see is that in these protocols, if, if the short protocols, the lactate you get is probably from one or even two stages before, right? So it was not matching. So I wanted to see what, what there's, when you reach some steady state within a, within a, a step, let's say, five minutes, I think it's reasonable to, to a minimum, right? But definitely 10, that's where you can see uh, you're, you're, you're for sure that the lactate you're getting is from that same step. And then what I wanted to see is also, not only that, it's like how I wanted to observe the athlete at that intensity. So for example, in, in a two minute, a two minute protocol, right? Two athletes finish that step with let's say three millimoles of lactate. Right. So the conclusions would be, oh, they're, they're the same here. Right. Right. But eight minutes later, one athlete is still at three millimoles and the other one is maybe at seven. So that's when you start discriminating and see that, whoa, this is this exercise, and this power output or this uh, speed is not sustainable, you know, for this athlete, whereas for the other one is absolutely sustainable. Yeah. So that's when you start understanding the athlete better. And, and that's when it discriminates. And yes, when you apply that protocol, that's when Veloki was by far the best guy on the team. Right? <laughs> and he can ultimately prove it on on the road as well, right? Yes. And, and this is what I've seen with, with ever since, right? And we still see it. Like with, with Tade, if we had done the, the like, the, for example, we, we do like a 20-minute protocol, which is very common in cycling. Yep. Yep. And uh, um, yeah, and Tade is not one of the best. You know, uh, he, he is the best in the world, probably with five hours in your legs, right. your 20 minute effort. But off the body, if you do just like a full out 20 minutes, uh, big guys, you know, they're, they're probably going to beat him, you know. But this is what, when you do the protocol that I do now, oh, he's from a different planet. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you went, that, that you took the time to go through that because all too often, in particular for this audience, they will think about doing one of these physiological tests and the outcome that the outcome of that test, they tend to like compartmentalize or trivialize into a little box where they get their VO2 max numbers and that's it. Yeah. And particularly with the test that you've designed, I think one of like the ingenious parts of it that you, that, that, that you started to describe is that the test itself is really it's a microscope into the athlete's internal physiology. And you're looking at it on with a really heavy uh, microscope into the bioenergetics, right? How they're metabolizing substrate in particular yeah. and what their mitochondrial function actually looks like. To set this up, why is that so important in sport? Why is that a differentiator between the really good athletes and the average athletes? Yeah, that's a great question also. So this is why I also started to realize that VO2 max, it's a number that I haven't used it in 25 years, to be honest, you know? <laughs> it doesn't give as much because this is this is my day to day. You see an app, two athletes who have a very similar VO2 max, um, regardless of the level, professional or recreational, and, 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 and they, do, they both have the same VO2 max, and one is way better athlete than the other one. So there's got to be something at that more cellular level, right? Uh, more at the metabolic efficiency. And, and in fact, now, after all these years, because I've been used to doing this, but I never had the time to kind of put it together and, and find out. So we're going to publish this soon because we have a, a cohort of about 200, I mean, a whole number of 240-something athletes of different categories yeah. and looking at the, 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 the relationships between bo 2 and VO2 max, both VO2 at each step and VO2 max and lactate, for example. And the correlations are, are moderate to poor, hmm. right? So there's not much correlation. But anyway, this also explains what we have observed all these years. But that's what I wanted to get to the, hey, what, what the hell is happening at the metabolic efficiency? So I started to look into uh, stoichiometric, stoichiometric equations, looking at CO2 production and O2, where you can you can understand something that um, it was done a long time ago, you know, uh, um, by um, uh, uh, Francis Galeno. I no, gosh, I forgot who was, I forgot right now, and, and I apologize. It was in the 1800s. He started to look at, at respiration, looking at CO2 and O2. Yep. 
and then it was it was resurfaced by by frame with these equations, and you can then um, um, uh, uh, have a good understanding of uh, how much fat and carbohydrates you're oxidizing. And um, so I started doing this in, in 2006, and um, and Oscar Dukendrup from the Netherlands, he was doing it as well at the same time uh, for research purposes, and he wrote a lot about it, and, and uh, he's a great scientist, and I was applying it. Right, um, but a lot of people thought it was a waste of time, you know. But yeah, you know, like uh, it was very laborious, right? Right. And because uh, you have to go minute by minute and uh, look into the exit sheet and look at the equations, it was very laborious, but it was very helpful. Um, and now, yeah, 15 years ago is what a lot of people are doing now, looking at the substitution because it allows us to understand better what is the metabolic efficiency, and that's what we see the athletes they. They oxidize tremendous amount of fat, whereas others they don't, or others they they oxidize tremendous amount of carbohydrates in grams per minute. So we have to increase and adapt their diet, right? And this is what I, in fact, I did already in two thousand eight, where I was looking looking into all this, looking into grams per minute of of carbohydrate oxidation in in athletes. Uh, um, I saw that specifically in endurance athletes. Uh, I saw that the current guidelines back in the days, uh, they were probably not, not correct because the current guidelines were uh, calling for 30 to 60 grams per hour of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. right? And, and I was scratching my head and like, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. So I, 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 I started to say, okay, let's, we have to go 80 to 100 grams per hour. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that, yeah, I was, I was very highly criticized by doing this, you know, because it was crazy. Uh, humans, <laughs> yeah, humans can't not absorb that much. Yeah, exactly. The whole you know, it's yard. impossible. And, and, um, and, and I remember going to, to Asker Jukendrup uh, and say, Hey, Asker, like I'm, I'm, I'm using this and I'm, I'm, I think between 80, 100 grams is, is what they should have in events over, over three hours or so. But people think that um, this is a crazy idea. What do you think? And, and I remember he told me, I'm working on the same concept. And I think that about 90 grams is what I would recommend. So mm -hmm. it was very reassuring to know that the top guy in the world was also aligned with this. The, the funny thing is like 12 years later, you know, many of these people who were criticizing <laughs> this concept, now they're giving conferences <laughs> throughout the world and writing guidelines saying that it's not 80 to 100, it's 90 precisely. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but anyways, but it, it, it definitely works. Uh, so, but anyways, all this came out from doing these methodologies. Otherwise, I, I would never realize. I didn't realize that that, was, that that was part of the story because you were almost reverse engineering it from what you were seeing on the bioenergetic side. Asker came into it from this is what the gut can absorb, right? This is what we see from a from a glucose and fructose mm -hmm. transport side of things. And then coming up with the magical and very precise mm -hmm. 90 grams per minute number. But you were almost taking it from the like the other side of the equation from from what I gather. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not as smart as uh, uh, Asker. <laughs> Nobody and, and, and yeah, exactly. So I, I <laughs> I, I just have to come up with that. Uh, and, and yeah, he, he has definitely um, uh, taught us tremendous amount of information yeah. about the, the transport of, of carbohydrates. Uh, and um, yeah, it just came from a different angle, yeah. more practical, because this is what I was doing. I, I was not doing looking at this for research purposes. I was doing already for, for, for application with athletes. Yeah. Right? I, I wanted to see, and, and, and back then I, I was working with, uh, I started working, that was a year later, I worked with, uh, I started working with Garmin team. Yep. And uh, that's what I started to implement these methodologies, 80 to 100 grams, and we took it to the Tour de France. And uh, yeah, and it worked quite well, no GI distress. Obviously, you have to do it correctly. Yep. Incrementally. And, and, and train the, the stomach in some cases. But, but yeah, I, we've been very successful into even, even way more than 100 grams per hour, uh, for sure, for sure. And it works, but you have to do it correctly. But that's kind of the approach that, that, that I had back in the days. Well, and so this brings up a really interesting part. And first off, I remember very vividly in my coaching career, making that transition from a 30 to 60 grams per hour recommendation to a 60 to 90. That, that was a marked transition because that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of, that's a lot yeah. of rates. And we were primarily relying on 
what I would call Asker's methodology or his rationale for that in terms of this is what your gut can tolerate as long as you have the right combination of carbohydrates. But since then, one of the things that has evolved is this, this notion to try to, to train your body specifically or try to induce training protocols very specifically around how to enhance mitochondrial biogenesis. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, we can take, we can look at this a number of different ways. We can look at elite endurance athletes are good fat oxidizers from the get go. We can look at what they, you know, what they can eat and drink from a dietary perspective. And I was wondering what your thoughts are specifically on how trainable this is. And if, if we can enhance mitochondrial biogenesis, what are the, like, what are the heavy hitters in terms of how we can actually enhance that in order mm -hmm. to improve performance? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. And, and so, so going back to, 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 to the, the, the strip serialization, that's where I developed this methodology to indirectly look at mitochondrial function mm -hmm. and metabolic flexibility just by looking mainly at fat oxidation and, and lactate, because both are uh, mitochondrial substrates, right? During exercise, uh, glucose, is not a valid value tracker to know mitochondrial function because glucose can be um, oxidized into uh, in the mitochondria via oxphos or reduced to lactate, right, uh, in the cytosol. Uh, so it's not mitochondrial dependent. However, uh, um, um, uh, fat during exercise has to be oxidized in the mitochondria, and lactate is oxidized in the mitochondria as well. In the adjacent, is mainly produced in the uh, 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 fast twitch muscle fibers and travels mainly to the adjacent uh, slow twitch muscle fibers. Although also George Brooks discovered the mitochondrial lactate oxidative complex where lactate can also be oxidized within the same muscle fibers in the mitochondria mm -hmm. through a specific transport. But anyways, the whole thing is that that has allowed me to understand, you know, exercise intensities and, and, and understand mitochondrial function. So when it comes to mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, my humble opinion, uh, the only way to improve it is by training mitochondria, not by restricting food and, and, and fat, um, which is the approach that many people are doing, right? You'd restrict carbohydrates or, 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 or calories so, so the mitochondria get bigger, right? There, there's no proof, scientific proof of that. There, there are a few studies showing that it, it, there's an increase in expression in PC, um, PC, um, uh, PCG1 alpha, right, which is our main precursor of mitochondrial function at the RNA level, right? But the fact that you have an increase in the genetic expression, that doesn't mean at all that you're going to produce a protein that is going to elicit, you know, that mitochondrial function. And I always put this example if you are, if they lock you in, a hypoxic room with very little oxygen for an hour, right? Your HIV-1 alpha levels are going to go off the chart, right? But you're not going to come out of that room with a five points higher <laughs> hematocrit or, or two points higher hemoglobin, right? right? right. Um, so that, that, that's not enough. So this is the same thing. So a few studies came out with this and uh, since the RNA, MR, mRNA expression was higher, uh, from, from, you know, for example, carbohydrate restriction, people throw right away, oh, this is going to increase mitochondrial biogenesis. And this is what the whole concept of, of, uh, of um, trade low in carbohydrates, right? Some studies showing that definitely, you know, also there's not, that's not a case there, you know? And a colleague of mine, um, uh, his nutritionist from our team, Gorka Prieto, is working on a study now on these concepts, and he's showing that uh, it doesn't increase uh, that mitochondrial function. So th this is what um, uh, this this is why it, it, we're seeing. It. But but what we're seeing is that all these many of these people doing restriction of carbohydrates, um, they yeah they get into an overtraining state, um, uh, which I'm sure you have questions about that. But uh, it's, it's usually is detrimental for for training. Well, and that's when when I kind of like back into the argument. 
that's where I've always come at it from a coach is that, okay, maybe let's just say that all of the genetic expression that you just mentioned, let's say we can fast forward 10 years and that, and that actually comes out of the end of the tunnel that, yeah, okay. That genetic expression does lead to an improvement in, in, in mitochondrial biogenesis. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, let's just say theoretically that that is, that that is the case, although the evidence is pretty weak in your example of the hypoxic uh, environment is yeah. a great one. I'm going to steal that from you, by the way. <laughs> I'll give you credit for it. Uh, but let's say that that, that, that that is the case. Still, the, inc- the improvement that you're going to get from that, even in the best case scenario, by restricting carbohydrates, getting some additional mitochondrial biogenesis from that intervention, A, pales in comparison to what you do just by training hard, yeah. the heavy hammer in the room, and B can carry negative consequences with it as well. And mm-hmm. so it might be a one up five down situation. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not worth it as long as the training structure is there. That's the way I've always looked at it as a coach. Yeah, exactly. I a hundred percent agree. I couldn't agree more that, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a lot of effort and yeah, it, it usually has more wrong consequences uh, and undesirable consequences. And, and I've seen, unfortunately, many careers destroyed by this you know really brilliant cyclists or uh, runners or triathletes or swimmers um whose careers were destroyed because they someone told them that oh if i restrict carbohydrate i'm going to increase my mitochondria and i'm going to be more efficient and yeah and this is why i i i i i want to be an advocate for this you know because i've seen many careers destroyed by this and i'm not necessarily by no means advocating that you need to have carbohydrates by no by all means there's a time and place Right, the days that you don't train much, you don't need carbohydrates uh, that much. Obviously, the trains that you, the, the days that you train a lot, you need a lot of carbohydrates. You know, but restricting is not usually, in my modest opinion, a good idea from my experience as well. So you're not having any of these professional cyclists go out and do bonk rides or mm-hmm. you know fasted training sessions or any of this other stuff. And this has become like a training topic du jour amongst a lot of endurance athletes. I mean, cyclists fall, pre- I'm going to say prey to it, like I'm automatically biased against it, but we're, we're both in the same camp. Mm-hmm. Cyclists for athletes and in my world of ultra running in particular, because yes. you take everything to the 10th degree or the 100th degree, we see a lot of these training, we see a lot of these training interventions. And I've always looked at it as something that not only is not beneficial, but in a lot of ways can be contraindicated to improve yeah. performance like you just mentioned. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and this is what I, what I see, you know, that a lot of people, they get overtrained, uh, they get catabolic, um, and their performance just takes a dive, you know. Um, I've heard about some success stories, uh, but I have never seen them <laughs> with the athletes that I've worked, you know. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, you know, I've, I've been... I, all the time I get emails from people from around the country and the world, you know, uh, being in this hole uh, because of restricting carbohydrates during training. You know, they get overtrained, fatigued, and they, they, they can't turn it around. So th- this is one of the things that I- I'm not supposed to take care of these people, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because they should not be in that place, in, the, in, in that situation in the first place. But uh, yeah, it happens all the time, you know? And um, yeah, uh, so I, I think it's a problem. And I, and I think it's, it's lack of information, or, or sometimes, as, as we know, right, it's like there's a new tendency uh, in the sport that comes all back and forth all the time. And, 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 and someone needs to sell that book or that tendency yeah. to get new clients uh, supposed to do that, the, 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 the right stuff based on science and, and experience and evidence. So when you talk about training the mitochondria to improve it, I mean, you're literally saying we need to overload this system in order to produce more of them, just like we would think about overloading a muscle and a strength training uh, from a strength training perspective, or overloading the heart from a cardiovascular, you know, training perspective. Is that literally the way that you're looking at it is like almost the throughput, right, of substrate that you can push through the mitochondria that is the genesis for the improvement? Yeah, and, and, and this is what we know that exercise, right, is the, is the only medication where we know to improve mitochondrial function because you need to stimulate it, right? But, but uh, and this is what I've been learning, you know, and I keep learning, um, uh, is, is that what, what is the intensity necessary to improve that mitochondrial function? Uh, 
-hmm. And this is why I developed this also surrogates of mitochondrial function, like fat oxidation and lactate, which have allowed me to understand uh, quite well the intensities and the durations and the frequencies necessary mm -hmm. to improve that mitochondrial function, which is what I've been applying as, as the core uh, of my training methodologies. And that's what also I'm doing now to, uh, with populations with chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes or, or even cancer, where I'm, inc I'm incorporating this, and even ICU patients uh, to improve their metabolic uh, function. So okay, let's get in. Let's get into that a little bit because I want to talk about training zones and training ranges. And for the listeners out there, I had a, had a really good uh, podcast with somebody who I know you, that you're probably familiar with, Stephen Seiler. Mm -hmm. Talked about all different ways to how to contrive different training ranges. You you have you have the fascinating opportunity of you've got two very good pieces of data from the athletes that you work with in order to help design training ranges. Mm -hmm. First one of which is the test that you just mentioned. And the second one is the day-to-day -day training data from the power meters that you can use to kind of re recalibrate that. And both of those are incredibly, and the, once again, my audience is not gonna have a degree, much of a degree of familiarity with this because they don't, they, they, because the concept of a cycling power meter, it's just not, unless you've actually coached somebody with it, it's yeah. really hard to relay how powerful mm -hmm. it can be in terms of looking into what's going on. But I want to first, I want, I want to first, I want the listeners to first understand how you get to design training ranges and then have a discussion on if we don't have those tools available, yeah. what are the potential surrogates for those? What are the potential replacements to try to get the athletes in the right, like training pockets, so to speak. So let's start out with first with like how you, how you arrange those training ranges. Yeah. So the, the way I, I uh, contemplate coaching is, is looking at uh, our training is about bioenergetics, right? It's like, what, what are the bioenergetics needed for different sports? And, and, and also I, I, one thing that has helped me tremendously is that over the last 25 years, I've been involved in, in almost every kind of sport. And, and there's always a lot of things that you learn from other sports. I love that, by that the way. That you can bring. Right? I love uh, that. And I keep learning. I, you think sometimes that like, you start working with football players, mm -hmm. football teams, American football. And uh, you think that, oh, man, yeah, these guys are in the, stain, in the, in the Stone Age, right? And in general, they are. <laughs> but but <laughs> it's another conversation. You, you can you, you can learn a lot, you know. And and I've been able to learn a lot, you know, about different different methodologies they do for training. They're like, whoa, hmm, this makes sense. And you take it to to cycling, for example, yep. right? So that that cross talk between sports has has helped me a lot to to try to understand more the 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 the, the, the needs or the bioenergetics of each sport as well, right? And and what's going on. So, anyways, that's kind of how I how I approach uh, when, I, when I'm working with, a, with an athlete or a person, what is your bioenergetics as a, as a triathlete or as a runner, right? Uh, or as a, a 1500 meters or as a cyclist. So if, if you're in a sport where you need to uh, deploy all the bioenergetics, you need to stimulate all of them, right? And this is how I see things. So for example, a key bioenergetic piece is to improve fat oxidation and lactic clearance capacity. So this is where you need to stimulate mitochondria. And this is what I came up with the whole zone two thing, right? That's kind of like, I have the zone one, which is recovery. Not much happens there, right? right? Uh, I, I, I tell athletes uh, either take an off day and I force them to take an off day. Uh, and on and another day of the week, you're doing a recovery day, which is a coffee ride, you know, or, you know, Coke, right? If you want to go and have a Coke <laughs> with your friends, it's a, it's, it's more mental thing, but nothing, you're not going to stimulate any energy systems by doing an hour easy, um, you know, for the most part. Uh, but the zone two is what I've seen uh, where you improve that, this, this fat oxidation and lactate cleanse capacity by far. So that's where I'm, I've, and since those are surrogates of mitochondrial function, that's where I'm from liver of that zone two which has worked tremendously well for me. And, and, and more and more I see because I get messages from coaches and athletes throughout the world that they, it works for them as well. So that's one piece. The other piece is the whole uh, glycolysis, right? There's the, the high intensity, the, the turbo, 
which is this is where, where, where races are decided, right? Or competition are decided in many sports. So you need to have a good turbo, a good glycolytic capacity. And, uh, and, and for that, there's a series of glycolysis. You need to have a, a higher glycolytic flux and function and enzymes. And that's something that you need to stimulate as well, right? And, and this is what I call uh, the zone four. Right. Uh, this is like a, your your threshold, your lactate threshold, if you will. This is where you have the highest stimulation before entering a, a, a maximal effort, VO2 max effort. Right. But then you get closer to a anaerobic uh, effort. Right. So this is what I think that a lot of things happening there that must must be stimulated. And then zone three is more like something in a transition zone, if you will. Right, and, and this is what we see clearly also with the fat and carbohydrate oxidation. Uh, zone two is usually the, the fat max. That's where you oxidize the most fat because you're still recruiting the type two muscle fibers, which mainly oxidize fat, right? And, and you're not recruiting as much of the, of the fast two, two each muscle fibers, and therefore you're not consuming as much carbohydrate. So that's why you have the fat max. In the moment you start recruiting the, the fast twitch muscle fibers, you start, uh, you, you're, is, is, why you're recruiting the fast twitch muscle fibers? You're recruiting because you have a higher uh, metabolic demand to synthesize ATP. It's a higher exercise intensity, right? And therefore, yeah, with fat, you can, you can synthesize a lot more ATP, right? But uh, it's going to be a longer time to synthesize it. Whereas when you go at, um, at higher intensity, it's not about how much, but how fast. And that's why you, you make a switch from fatty acids to glucose. You seem to say significantly lower amount of ATP, much faster. And this is why you activate the fast twitch muscle fibers. And this is why you see the switch in this metabolic testing where the fat max disappears and it starts plummeting the fat oxidation and the glucose increases, right? And, and eventually the the, at that zone four glycolytic intensity, it, it's all the all the all the uh, um, um, all the uh, substrate comes from glucose, and there's no fat oxidation, right? And this is what you know, it, 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 this is this is how I I look at the bioenergetics, and from there I I translate all this um, data that I get from the metabolic test into training zones, right? So I establish this and, and also I, I obviously I do with this with lactate that correlates very well with everything right mm -hmm. and that's what I did translating this into training zones uh, to to target each of the different bioenergetic components uh, training zones are based in on heart rate based on power output based on speed right uh, based on um, um, on what's in the rowing machine yep. uh, even, even we can do with with swimmers uh, there's like a tap device right yeah. in their in their yeah, yeah, yeah. cup and then uh you know you can you can do it and we've done in the swim flume where you can say okay you know this is x amount of beats per minute in in, in the not in the heart because they cannot look at the heart but in this tap device yeah. you can program it yeah. and that's where you can go stride by stride yep. uh, you know stroke by stroke and uh and you can follow the pace so this is kind of how I, I i set up the training zones but let, let me understand this a little bit more clearly because a lot of the listeners will be familiar with the typical zone one through zone five construction. And the way that that happens is typically there's an anchor point. And I'm mm -hmm. emphasizing an intentionally because it's usually a singular point. It's yeah. functional threshold heart rate, functional threshold power, some lactate threshold pace or lactate threshold power. It's usually some point, some point, mm -hmm. and then the zones one through five or one through seven or one through 21, they seem to get more convoluted every year that I'm a coach. There's mm -hmm. three or four zones added, especially on the cycling side. But most of the time, the way that that construction happens is you find that point and then you extrapolate the, the zones and the ranges for each one of those zones around that point and around mm -hmm. percentages based off of that point. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing from you is, is you're looking at this bioenergetic continuum as a whole and saying, this, this is the bioenergetics at this heart rate or power output. And I'm going to assign zone one to this. This is the bioenergetics that, that is going on at this heart rate or power output. And I'm going to assign it at that. You're looking at it almost like 
through the whole continuum doing it that way as opposed to anchoring it off of, of a singular point. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, um, yes, but I also maybe I didn't, I, I didn't explain myself and I apologize. But um, yes, I look into this, but I also look into these transition points, mm, okay. which, which mean, there's a metabolic mean to that. So for example, the fat max, right? This is, this is where you can translate it into a heart rate. And this usually coincides with the first inflection point of lactate, right? Uh, away from uh, uh, resting levels, mm -hmm. right? Um, and usually coincides. So this is a metabolic uh, um, event where you're, you are uh, simulating the fast twitch, the slow twitch muscle fibers to the fullest right before the, 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 the fast twitch muscle fibers are predominant. Got it. So that bioenergetics, and this is where in the slow twitch muscle fibers, we have the highest mitochondrial number. And this is where I, that's you just simulate into the fullest, right? Uh, then the, the other point that I look a lot is into like when fat disappears completely, right? Fat oxidation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the predominant fuel is uh, carbohydrates. And at the same time, that coincides with the second inflection point of lactate, which traditionally we've been calling like the lactate pressure, yeah. yeah. right? Um, and it makes sense because fat disappears completely because the predominant fuel is carbohydrates and the, the mandatory obligatory byproduct of carbohydrate or glucose utilization is lactate. Yeah. So that's where you see a lot of lactate production. And this is why you know that there's a lot of glycolysis there and that's, that's another point. Uh, and this is how I, I, I around that, I construct the, the training zones. The other thing that we know is that blood lactate inhibits lipolysis. So when you have a higher blood lactate concentrations, uh, lipolysis is inhibited. So that's why you see that there's no fat in it. And this is exactly what we see in the metabolic testing with substrates, where you get to a high lactate concentration, fat disappears. Uh, and this is how uh, around these points too, which are metabolic events um, represented by energetics. That's how you construct training zones. I, I think the, the important point with that is there are points plural mm. yes. versus a singular point, which a lot of mm. people will say, okay, well, let's just determine the athlete's lactate threshold and we'll take 110% of it and make this range and we'll take 5% mm -hmm. of it and make that range. And that becomes a singular focus. You're looking at this continuum of biological events, bioenergetic events. Yes. So we're going to define the ranges by all of these events kind of in concert with each other almost. Yes, exactly. And also looking at what the specifics. So for example, the controversial point of the lactate threshold or right. maximal lactate state state or ventilatory threshold, you know, or, or, or FTP, right? Um, there are many, many uh, ways to describe it, but um you know, there are many ways. Let's say we, we stick to lactate threshold, for example. Is your lactate threshold or, 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 or functional um, uh, FTP, right? Functional threshold power is for what? For 10 minutes, for five right. minutes, mm -hmm. for 40 minutes or for one hour. Yeah. And, and this is where you throw a wrench into the whole thing, right? Because when you do a marathon, you're doing your marathon at your maximal lactate steady state. Yeah. You're doing your marathon at your threshold. Whether, whether it's uh, oh, right, slightly over two hours or it's three hours or it's four hours. When you do a marathon, you do it at a pace that you know that if you increase it like slightly bit, you're going to blow up, <laughs> Exactly. right? Which is the exact same concept when you do like a, a 15 minute effort at your lactate threshold, right? You know that if you increase five watts, you're going to blow up, Yeah. right? So this is the same concept. It is that uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the intensities are different. So, so this is why the, the, the thing when people told me, yeah, my lactate threshold is this or my FTP is that, I said, for what? For yeah, exactly. five minutes or for 40 minutes? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, so the way, I, I like the way that this is working out because the way that you describe this, we've, we've got a huge running audience and they're probably spinning their heads right now with all the cycling jargon. But one of the, I think one of the really important things that you mentioned is that working with all of these different sports gives you insight into the primary sport group that you end up working with. And what I found fascinating with working with a lot of cyclists, not nearly to the level as, as you have obviously, 
but because we generally have more what I'll say powerful tools to give mm -hmm. us insight into what's going on. Yeah. We can take that knowledge and extrapolate it when the tools aren't as when when the tool when the tools aren't nearly as sophisticated nor are they as 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 precise. Mm -hmm. And trail running is a great mm -hmm. example of that where we can't rely on pace. It's yeah. hard to rely on heart rate just for a number of different factors that is going to be go beyond the scope of mm -hmm. the scope of this podcast. But a lot of athletes will want to wonder, okay, how can I get into these correct bioenergetic ranges when I don't have metabolic a metabolic testing? Be a really smart person to interpret that metabolic testing and see a tool that I can use from a day to day training perspective, like a power meter that can tell me that I'm actually in these ranges. Like how, how is somebody going to figure it out when they don't have those tools available to them? I know that's a great question as well. And, and I mean, when I get asked that question, you know, I, I give up an old school answer and, and to my best um, knowledge, um, if I didn't have any of these tools, I would, I would try to understand very well the sensations and what happens, uh, what is the response of some, uh, signals of the body to these uh, metabolic stressors. So one of them is respiration, right? So, um, you know, the, the harder you breathe, the, the, the more oxygen you need to, 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 to use. And, and that means there's a higher metabolic stress, right? So, and I know it's old school, but um, wearing a heart rate monitor alone is not going to do much because, you know, you and I can, can, can have the same heart rate and be the same age and uh you might be fully uh lipolytic uh, and i'm glycolytic right? right so different metabolic states so heart rate doesn't give you a whole lot um the whole 220 minus your age uh, doesn't it's, it has never been even uh, uh uh proven scientifically even you know it's, it's observational but anyways the but the breathing I, I i pay a lot of attention to that um and in fact i mean i've done I've done so many tests to myself, right? And I was, before testing others, I was my own guinea pig, right? Um, so I know myself very well. So I, I guide myself through my breathing <laughs> sensations, right? So the whole thing is like, if I'm, if I'm breathing very easy and I can keep up a conversation with you at this pace, I'm probably doing zone one, right? If, 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 I'm, if it's taken me a little effort, you know, to, to, to talk to you, um, I, I, you know, so I, we can keep talking, but with some effort, that's probably your zone too, right? If you barely talk in poof, you have to cut, catch your breath, you know, every fourth, fifth word, uh, you're away from your zone two. You're probably in zone three. If you can't speak at all, definitely you're in zone four, right? Um, and if you're, you're yeah, if you, you're, you're, your eye crossed right here is on five or on six right but those are simple things that obviously is not as as real as or, or as accurate as doing in a, in a laboratory test but to be honest even if it looks like old school it's it's as real uh, or as accurate as it can be without tools and going back mm -hmm. to your your protege todd uh Tade, i heard and you can confirm this that if this is true that on the key time trial where he won the Tour de France, he didn't have any data available to him. He didn't mm -hmm. hear the radio coming through and he wasn't, he didn't have a power meter on his bike. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we decided the, the night before we said, Hey, let's, let's not use it. Let's go for it. So we, we have a, we have a software, you know, where we can look into the, the very precise power output that you need to do for every right. single section right. of the time trial. And we can build and model it. And predict, and uh, uh, and we could we could use it, but we decided not to for, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first of all, is that sometimes power meters they're not very very extremely accurate, and especially when you use in this state specifically, we have a road race. I mean, a road bike for the first part, and in the climb we have a second bike. So we we're working with two power meters, mm -hmm. and it's difficult that both read perfectly. So imagine that. The software is telling you that oh you need to go at 380 watts and you go at 380 watts but maybe it's reading five percent off or three percent off that's a big deal it's a big deal so you're actually going at 365 or 370 so you're losing time 
Or maybe it's the opposite. Imagine that, yeah, you're going 380 and actually you're going at 400 or, or <laughs> and you go yeah, up, right, right? right? So that's where like we, we, we decided, no, no, no. And, and, and with today, Pogacar, well, when we train, we do very, very millimetrically. You know, everything right. is very well measured right. day by day by day. But when it comes to the competition, we, we went old school because um, we, we, we had a good conversation the night before and say, look, Tade, you have nothing to lose. Uh, the second uh, position at the tour is secured. Whether you blow up or whether you do a good time trial or not, you're going to be podium mm -hmm. and be the, 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 you're going to have the young jersey, right? So let's go for it. And Tade, is that, that's the thing too. That's his mentality. You, you know, for this, he's a beast out there. You cannot tell, hey, Tade, you know, take it easy here. No, no, no. He's going to go for it as we <laughs> see. You know, when he goes, he goes. And in the race, he, he, he transforms and that's what he did. He had nothing to lose. And he said, okay, in the flat section, I'm going to go for it. And, and maybe I can get to the bottom of the climb and, and have a much faster time than uh, Roglic, right? And, and that when Roglic gets that reference, he's going to freak out. And I'm going to mess up with his mind, <laughs> right? And that's exactly what happened. And then if I blow up, I blow up. But if I don't, hey, maybe it works. And, and, and he didn't blow up. And Roglic blew up mentally yeah. and physically. It's the other thing. You know, a lot of people say, oh, he did an amazing time trial. But unfortunately for Roglic, he did his worst time trial in years yeah. too, right? So it was both, right? But it's, it was not just that the, the they did a fantastic time trial. I mean, Roglic was like sixth or seventh that day, yeah. you know, where he should have won it or be second, right? That's, that's the whole thing, you know? Um, I saw another comment from one of the Jumbo guys uh, from Van Aert, um, where uh, he, 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 uh, he was kind of surprised, but, you know, he, he, he went up there with a time trial. How can you climb, you know, with a time trial and, and think that you're going to be faster than someone who did a very fast uh, uh, climb, I mean, change of bikes and use a climbing bike, you know, that's, that's not possible. And, and also the other thing too, is that we had prepared that time trial yeah. that they had gone to the place in, in July. And, uh, we did a recognition. We did it two times on the same day, one just to recon the, the place and second, you know, time trial speed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we practiced the, the, the change of bike several times. So we really prepared for that time trial. And so he knew every corner, every area, and um, so it was not just random. Ah, let's, let's go for it. No, no, we, we knew that, that, that the course. I'm so glad I got to hear that story straight from the horse's mouth. I hope the listeners appreciate that. The most fascinating thing to me in the whole or 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 deal in go is you have an athlete that is at the most like this is the like could be the height of their career. He could go on win five more Tour de France. Who knows, right? <laughs> This could be the most pressure packed event of his entire career. He's been training in an incredibly meticulous scientific way, all the way from the training ranges to getting the physiological testing to all the recon that you just mentioned is picture perfect precision <laughs> yet on the, on the deciding day. And everybody knows it's the deciding day. <laughs> we say, you know what, we're taking all this technology we're throwing it out the window and we're just saying, go as hard as you can and win. Like, yeah. I just love, I just love that concept because it shows the beauty of sport and kind of exactly. going, back, going back to like our original conversation of we can have, it's awesome to have all of this information to help tailor the, the training for athletes in terms of training ranges and time and intensity and volume and all these things that all these buttons that we push as coaches. But at the end of the day, athletes still has to go out and do the work. In this Absolutely. case, at the end of the day, the athletes still have to go out and compete, right? They still have to compete. Absolutely. And this is the beauty of the beauty of the sport and the beauty of the champions. You know, champions right. that come out in these situations or in all sports, like so many examples come to my mind, you know, like you know, the famous uh, um, uh, final of NBA, I forgot which year, with Michael Jordan, you know, right. everything was precisely, and I'm sure they had the statistics and they have, and, and, and leading into that game, they, they train very well, they, 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 mm -hmm. they, they practice and practice and practice the techniques, but they get to a game and, and, and Jordan said, hey, 
I'll take care of this today, right? <laughs> Just give me the ball. <laughs> give me the ball. I'll take care of it, right? And this is what we see also with uh, Ronaldo or yeah. Messi in soccer, yeah. and or yeah. we see with uh, um, um, gosh, I forgot, um, uh, um, Tom Brady, right? Yeah. You know, he's like, hey, hey, guys, Just give me uh, the ball. I'll, Give me the ball. I'll do my magic today. This is what I'm for, right? This is what we see in the beauty of the sport, that these natural champions that come out in, in the most unexpected ways. I love it. I love it. Put me on the bike. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're going to leave it at that. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. Like I said, I've been enamored with your career way before all of this Thank Twitter, so Twitter France hoopla. Like you, you're, you're, you're one of the outstanding people in the world and one of the very few sports scientists that can take their intimate scientific knowledge and blend it into coaching, which is not easy. And you realize how difficult that is as well. Like coaching and science, it's, those are two hard worlds to, to, to kind of blend together. And obviously you found a really good way to do it. And the success is the, uh, is, is the proof of all that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We'll have to have you back on again once your schedule clears up towards the fall or something like that. Well, thank you. I would love to. And I appreciate your invitation. And, and yeah, I mean, this is something that I keep learning every day. And, and the more you, the more you learn, the more, you know, and, and the more you, you realize that you need to keep learning. And, and yeah, the other thing too is that, you know, uh, you need to fail. You know, I, I, I've had a lot of failures too, right? Uh, and this is like why you keep learning and, and improving and, and learning from the mistakes and keep moving forward, right? And, um, and, 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 and keep learning, you know? And, and up, you know, after 25 years, uh, you start getting good at some things, you know? But more for, you know, and, and it, I can't believe I, I am saying this because when you're young, you're brave and you think that everything is about knowledge and you know everything, right? But the older you get, as I am now, the more you realize that the experience is a big factor, right? I know more now from the experience than from the knowledge, probably, because you get to see a lot of things, right? And, and, and make a lot of mistakes. But when you're young, you make mistakes and don't realize, right? And and later, and you know, you know, later on in, in your career, say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was training that way. I was telling them to eat this way or something like that, right? But and, and I made my own mistakes when I was a cyclist. I, I never got to be a top level cyclist. I, I, I was professional in the U S for two years, but very low level and, and nothing. But anyways, the, the whole thing is like, I, I, I was one of the top amateurs in, in the Basque country before coming to study my undergrad in the U S but I was very good. Um, but I didn't know how to train. I overtrained. I overcooked myself. I didn't know how to eat. I made so many mistakes as an athlete and, and I and, and and this has helped me a lot. All these huge mistakes that I made, I see these happening in so many athletes now, right? So this is what has helped me to 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 understand from my own mistakes, and and still I keep learning every day. And and as the more tools that we have to measure human body, the more we understand. And this would be the way it, it is, you know. And 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 ten years later from now, I mean, we we'll look back to today and say, oh my gosh. We were thinking about this way, you know, where <laughs> that's the beauty of all this, I guess. I can't believe we were recommending 30 yeah. grams of carbohydrate. I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay. you you know, gotta learn. That is spoken like a true coach yeah. and a true scientist that has been in the game for a long, long time. 20 years from now, we'll be saying stuff that I can't believe we, you know, I can't believe we designed this this way. We'll look back I on know. this podcast and we'll both look like idiots. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> so we'll have, to run it. we'll have to run it back. Yeah. Really, before before we go, you're an awesome Twitter follow. I I, I learned a lot from your Twitter. Oh, thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, from your Twitter feed. Where can people mm-hmm. find you there? I'm sorry? What, What's your Twitter? What is your Twitter handle? Where can people uh, find you? Dr. Inigo. And I'll include uh, links to that in the show notes as well. Some of the relative or relevant research that we went over. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Jason. And yeah, congratulations for your podcast and uh, the work you do, which is it's crucial, right? To to, uh, to to send a lot of uh, of the information you gather from a lot of people and, and yourself as well to the audience, because you know you do a great work at uh helping in the education of, of many athletes and coaches and it's very necessary especially nowadays where we're, we're bombarded by a lot of stuff so <laughs> i appreciate your work oh also. thank you very much that means a lot to me i appreciate it thank you
And there you have it, folks. There you go. I still cannot believe that Inigo's and I's paths have not crossed yet. We have lived in the same town, worked in the same town for I don't know how many years and played in the same pools. And yet this is the first conversation that we've actually had. And I absolutely loved it. So thank you, Inigo. You are welcome back on the podcast anytime you want. I'm sure the guests will appreciate it a lot. Thank you to all the listeners out there. If you have not had the chance to do so, head on over to Apple Podcasts and give this podcast a rating or a review. It means a lot to me personally when I see those reviews come through. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.